Good morning. Good morning. Check, check. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Uh, can I just get just a teeny little more volume? I know you could hear me, but good morning. Good. Um, it's great to see you uh, on the first Sunday of the new year. Um, I am particularly encouraged to see an old friend, uh, Chuck Hyo. Haven't seen him for ages, but he's back here at Jubilee with his beautiful bride or wife. So I've never done this before, but I just have them in my pocket. This is the hottest commodity at Jubilee right now. It's called Cafe 2510 Voucher. <laughs> Each one can give you any espresso drink you want, and they serve the most expensive coffee beans <laughs> in town. It's amazing. It's, it actually costs twice more than Starbucks coffee. So uh, this is a real deal. So yeah, it's right here in the next building in Grace Hall. And I know there are others who are visiting today feel like, well, how about me? How about me? Come to me afterwards, OK? I'm going to get few for you, OK? <laughs> Uh, but Chuck's been in our youth ministry, and uh, I can't believe, how old are you now? 33. 30. <laughs> Come on, be honest. Yeah, his wife says he just turned 34, so. Wow, I, I didn't realize that he's actually much older than my oldest son. So you've been here. Uh, I, it's been a long time ago, but anyway, I've been here more than... Well, he, he's been, his family's been at Jubilee almost from the first day. So, I mean, wow, that's a lot of reminder. Psalm 119 is our passage. Pastor Joe lied last Sunday that I'll be preaching from Haggai. <laughs> we, I never told him that. So I was like, what happened? But uh, I'm on the first week uh, reading of Psalm 119. Uh, the reading started from the New Year's Day, uh, and uh, we're already on the sixth, sixth day uh, in the New Year. So, uh, for I, I, I know at least Brett uh, here was in the early morning prayer every time for the last four previous days. <laughs> he said he woke up at two each morning. <coughs> He must have received some uh, gift of tongue, uh, not, not speaking, but at least hearing, because I, I didn't say any words, not too many words in English, but he was here every morning. <laughs> so I, I, I went through the, um, uh, much of it, but today we're going to uh, verse 81, um, and we're going to cover two segments of eight verses each. Uh, down to verse 96. Let me read this passage and then give you a little introduction to Psalm 119. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. 
Well, Psalm 119, as you can see, is the longest of the 150 psalms that we have in the book collection of hymns called the Psalms. Um, so it is the longest, and it actually has a very interesting uh, layout. It's longest because there is an aim. The poet here is using a very interesting literary device called acrostic uh, poem making, acrostic. Acrostic means that uh, you are taking a particular scheme that is known uh, to all the readers or all the hearers of, of, of this poem. And they would immediately see there's a literary pattern there. Uh, and that scheme in this particular case is, as typically is, is what we might call the uh, Hebrew alphabet. Well, when I say alphabet, that, that's English, right? So, but you, you know what I mean. Uh, and Hebrew alphabet, by the way, is purely made of 22 consonants. So no vowels. Vowels are actually dots uh, in Hebrew text. And the original Hebrew text presumably did not have any vowel points. It's all consonants. And somehow they were able to read that. So there are 22 consonants in Hebrew language. And each section of eight uh, begins with the sequential listing or sequential usage of that consonant in all eight verses. So for example, in the first eight verses, uh, there is a consonant symbol Aleph, and that Aleph would be used for every single first word of each verse, right? So eight times 22, 172, <laughs> am I right? So at the end, I'm sorry, 176, uh, I'm wrong. But anyway, so 8 times 22, 176 verses in all is what you have. Um, English translation that I have is very kind to have the, the anglicized uh, 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 spelling of each uh, a consonant as they come. So if you have your Bible like mine, ESV, you will know that there's Aleph, there's Beth, there's Gimel, and there's um, Dalet. And, and so you could say, basically, uh, this is what the alphabet sounds like. So the passage that we read uh, starts from Kaf. So there's a K word, almost. And then the second part is Lamet. And indeed, it's sort of uh, 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 that sound, like L sound. So there, there is uh, these... Uh, uh, features uh, presented to us uh, at just the appearance of this text. Um, it's a work of an artist. It's, a, it's an artistic crafting. Uh, you know, the poets use words to create art form. Uh, brilliant people, poets, the good poets, are incredible that they are able to pull out words and you may not all the, know all the words. Sometimes we have to pull out dictionaries to figure out what they're saying. But the words are used appropriately. It's used in a beautiful way. So when you read poems, poems are meant to be read aloud. Uh, you hear certain patterns in the sound. So it is very, very deliberate. So it's something about the art form that is created by using words. You know what I think arts uh, should be? I mean, that's, that's me, and you may, you may have a little different, perhaps more expert opinion about what art is, but as I understand it, uh, for at least the Christian perspective, is that art originates from God's beautiful creation. The pattern, the harmony, the beauty that you find in what God has done. And that beauty is captured. Uh, and by using the devices that you use, to somehow capture the beauty and let the beauty come through the, the means by which, which you portrays, uh, portray the beauty of, of, of God's creation, his wonder. So something very aesthetically pleasing is going on in this psalm. It's a grand project, and the psalmist or the poet has done wonderful thing by giving this to us. Uh, look how he restrains himself 
that as he puts this psalm together, he's not just going all over the place. There is a sense of discipline in it. There is a sense that he is controlled by the words that are given to him. There is a sense of um, obedience to the pattern that he has. You know why this is so brilliant? It's because the structure fits the content. Uh, what I'll, I'll give at least three things as an introduction to, to, the, to the psalm here. First is that uh, the, when you look at the contents, you realize that, that what we have here is uh, the poet praising the value and the glory of the word of God. Uh, he, he does it in every verse. There's something about God's word that is marvelous. There's something about the word of God that is beautiful. Uh, as the last verse says that we read this morning, the word of God is, in a sense, infinite. It's exceedingly broad. Everything else that might boast perfection in this world have limits. Has limits, but the word of God is limitless. So there is a praise and marveling of the qualities that he finds in the word of God. So I would say that Psalm 119 is a feast. It's like going to a huge buffet where I'm talking about good buffet, <laughs> long table with all sorts of marvelously prepared um, delicacies, good food. And you go there and you just pick and choose whatever you want. And Psalm 119 looks to me like a huge long table where there is a festival going on, celebrating the beauty and the glory of the Word of God. And think about what God's Word is. God's Word is not just any words. God's Word is God's revelation captured into human language and brought to us. It's amazing. It's, it's what God has done in His infinite wisdom. Right? He God communicates himself to us in this way. And uh, the psalm uh, writer is actually, in, even in the way he structured it, he is submitting himself to the pattern of the word. It shows that he's submissive to the topic itself. He's submissive to the fact that we're dealing here with, with God's word, and my attitude to God's word is I submit myself to it. I, I think it's just beautiful. Uh, secondly, what I observe here is that he is, because he's such a master uh, with language, with words, he doesn't simply use the word, the word, right? Dabar. That's not the only word he uses to talk about God's word. But he uses various terms, various. He picks out so many different ways to say the same thing. He's, he's masterful in that. So there are words that are translated into English by using many different terms, such as commandments, statutes, testimonies, ways. Um, I, I can't even come up with all of them. So if, even if you as, as you, as you read through the passage that we read together today, there are many words that essentially means that, mean that. That is the word, the word, your promise, for example, your word, um, your statutes, um, um, uh, your law, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm keep going here, but you know what I mean, precepts. And so there's so many different words basically pointing to the same reality, okay? The word of God is present with us in many different shapes and forms, but they are all pointing to that God, one and only God. Okay, third point. Now, this is really, really important. Okay, c come along with me with this. So more, more I'm assured as I studied Psalm 119, that is... The, the psalmist is actually saying the word of God has all the same qualities and characters as God himself. Did you get that? The word of God has all the same characters and qualities as God himself. He could take any adjective about God and apply it to the word of God and it'll work. And with that reality, I'm going to tell you this. Word of God is on the same plane and in an equivalent weight as God himself. Now, that may sound a little shocking to you, 
But that is a very important Christian testimony. Because John would even come along uh, in, in his days and he would say, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And everything was made through the word. The word is personified ultimately in the person of Jesus Christ and we call him the word that became flesh and dwelled among us. But the word of God is divine. So I tell you what, do you want to fellowship with God? Do you want to meet God? Do you want to go face to face with God? You want a kind of spirituality where you have a living, vital relationship with God? How do you do it? How do you do it? Christian way, scriptural way is to do it through the word. When you meditate on the word, you're meditating on who God is. When you face the word, you are facing God. When you fellowship in the word, you are fellowshipping with God. You want to have something to do with God, you got to go to the word. The word, by the way, is always going along with the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit's work, there is no Word of God. Scripture you have is because the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets and the apostles to bring it forth. And when you read it, it's the Holy Spirit that's breathing out the breath of God. When the Spirit works with the Word, your heart is illumined. We call it the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit turns the switch on in your heart it's the spirit that brightens so that you may know what the word says. I, I, I love it when I, when, I, when I describe this. The word of God is by which you know God. Word of God is by which you fellowship with God. Word of God is by which you come to God. Okay? So, I mean, you could tell me anything about your relationship with God. You, you might say, well, you know, I have this really good relationship with God. And I would ask you, how do you, how do you know? How do you do it? Oh, uh, when I when, once in a while I dream about God. You know, I have this very fantastic mystical way of meeting with God. How do you know that's God? How do you know? I would say if you don't fellowship with the Word, if the Scripture is not part of your life, if you're not walking with God in the Word on a regular basis, you don't know God. Imagine, I mean, not imagine, uh, realize this point, okay? That is when. When God appeared to the first Old Testament church, I, 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 I guess we could call it the Old Testament church in the, in the formal way, that is the Exodus Israelites, they're coming to Mount Sinai to worship God, that's what God wants. And God descends upon the top of the mountain. Moses recalls the event and Moses says what? He says, when God appeared on Mount Sinai, we did not see his form. We, we, we did not see what he looked like. We, didn't, we don't know what God looks like. But we heard his voice. His word came to us. Remember what the, what the commandment says, the Ten Commandments? You shall not have any other gods before me. Commandment number one. And the next command is what? Do not make any images of me. Do not try to visualize me. Do not try to make something up and say, that's God. Don't do that. You did not see me. My form had not appeared to you. You might have seen a radiating something, but that's not me. God's form was not seen, right? No one has ever seen God. That's even the New Testament testimony. But the word of God has come to us. How do you know God? Who is God? You can't visualize him. Only by the word, God communicates to us. Here and now, the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, ultimately showed us who God is. But even as we worship Jesus, isn't it interesting that we don't have a portrait of Jesus hanging in a room? The Reformed conviction is that we don't even hang a cross inside a chapel. Were you not thinking of that when you come into our church? Well, there are a couple crosses, like, engraved, so... I like, I like to take that out too, but reformed people don't hang up a cross. I, I, I know that a lot of churches you went to, they, they have cross inside the center to, to show something. Well, we have it outside, basically says this is a Christian church, but you don't have it in the worship room. Why? Because 
You don't worship anything, not even cross. You don't come before the cross and say, that's where God is. No. This is so serious. God says, no image. But you worship me as I prescribe to you in the word. That is our conviction. We know God through his word. And again, the word is not just dry text. Word is not just dry words. But the word of God always accompanies the Holy Spirit. The person of God, invisible yet made real, communicable, understandable through the word that he brings to our heart. So in the new year, I'm going to give you this charge. That is, you know, I, I'll tell you what. You, you, could, you could say anything about your faith, and I, I respect you. I'm sure that you have many different ways that you have experienced God. But I will tell you what. Um, if you do not walk with the word of God, if the scripture is not part of your life, if you don't have the word that you're walking with in your life, then uh, I think there will be very little chance for you to grow in grace. So my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, get very serious about it. You know, even when you sing, sing the scriptures if you can. That's why certain uh, churches would, would uh, make effort to sing psalms more than anything else. You know, don't just make up. Let the word of God truly guide us through. Well, having said that, now I, there's so many things that we could say about each portion of this psalm, but we're going to go to some, uh, the portion that we read uh, for today, verse 81. Um, observation. Um, first is the present condition of the poet here. And it is, it is very desperate. The poet says, my soul longs for your salvation. Verse 82, my eyes long for your promise. Uh, that sounds very uh, mild, but the word that is used here as my soul longs, it's, it's not just longing. It's not just longing. It, it, the word literally means uh, the end. Uh, having come to an end. Uh, uh, so l let me reread that. So my soul has come to an end of waiting for your salvation. If you could understand it that way. Uh, he trusts in God's salvation, but, but here he's, he's confessing that he's almost at the end. It, it, I, I think that expression makes perfect sense. I'm at the end of the rope. I'm hanging on a rope and I've come to an end. If I let this go, I'm done. So that's, that's precisely the, uh, the image that we have. My eyes fails as it anticipates for your promise. I have come to an end. Uh, that same word is repeated in verse 87. They have almost made an end of me on earth. He's talking about how uh, the people that are insolent, prideful, are uh, persecuting him and and they are making him almost come to an end of his life. That precise word, the end, is the same word used in verse 81 and 82. It's a desperate situation. There, there, there seems to be uh, um, this, this condition of absolute desolation. If, if I may put it this way, there's this... This utter dryness of the soul. Uh, the, the poet has suffered for a long, long time. He, he suffered. He waited. He's, he's just waiting for something fresh to happen, something new to happen. He's waiting for healing to take place. He's waiting, waiting, waiting. But the waiting has gone so long. It has come to that point where now he's at that, that, that point of just passing away. Uh, the way he expressed it poetically is in verse 83. For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. A wineskin in the smoke. Uh, that expression is 
very vivid. I mean, it may not come to us in that kind of vivid form because we don't know what's going on here, but you know, what is a wineskin in that time? Wineskin is made of uh, the whole skin of a sheep. Sheep, okay? Um, one sheep. <laughs> you, you basically make a, 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 a wine sag or wine container out of a one sheep as it's killed and you sort of cut off the four legs and then uh, you, I guess you, you do this too, and then <laughs> there's the sheep and you need to take the entire content out from inside, but keep the skin intact. Imagine that, right? So you have um, uh, what at the end of the day looks like nothing but just the skin left in its form, in, in the whole form, right? You could imagine this, it's a little gross, but, but that's what it is. So they, they scrape out all the inside, and I'm sure they get rid of all the hair, and make it into nothing but the skin looking like a round thing, and you tied all the holes, make sure that there's no leakage, and then you pour into that probably is very, at the, at the time, very um, soft, uh, flexible, uh, uh, you know, it, it probably wouldn't just stand, but you, you put brand new wine into that skin, into that sack. And what happens as the time goes by, as the wine is fermenting inside for a long, long time, you could imagine it, right? That skin will expand. Uh, elasticity, elasticity, elasticity of that skin is what guarantees it from breaking and bursting. So you cannot have a hard skin in the beginning. It has to be very flexible. It's, a, it's an animal skin, fresh skin. And as the, as the wine, you know, uh, bubbles up inside, gas comes out and everything, it expands, expands, and it comes to a point where it remains the same. And... You preserve that wine long enough to have it come out just right. And at that point, what happens is that the skin had hardened. It had created a form by which it stands. And when you pour out all the wine from the wine skin, what remains at the end is a very hard, almost plastic hard, wine case. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, new wine in a new wineskin. Remember that phrase? You cannot use the old wineskin for the new wine. Why? If you do that, it'll break. It cannot stand the fermenting because the skin gets harder and hardened. So what do you do with an used up skin? Well, you, there's really nothing you can do with it. I mean, it, it looks, looks to me like it's something you use once for your precious wine. I'm sure it contains quite a bit. And after that work is done, after you've finished using it, then what do you do with this hardened, old wineskin? You throw it into fire. You burn it. You consume it. So picture it in your mind, okay, when this wineskin is thrown on a, a fire, and uh, I don't know if you ever cooked any kind of dry thing <laughs> inside your fireplace. <laughs> dry squid, anyone? <laughs> but if you, if you put a dry squid on top of a fire, guess what? It doesn't catch fire right away. You know what it is? You, it, you put it there, it gets heated up, and you see this white smoke coming up. <laughs> if you've never done this, go home and try it, right? <laughs> so... That's the image. It's, it's, it's something that people are so familiar with. Look at it. For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. I'm used up. I'm at the end. I'm dried up. Fire is on me. And all I see is smoke coming out of me. Um, wow, this is a very vivid picture of the condition this man is in. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm at that point where I say... I, I, there's nothing more that I can do. Um, you know, being a pastor, you um, 
are subjected to um, many different situations that, that you don't want to face. And I've seen people uh, with horrible, horrible disease that just uh, puts a person in that condition at the end. It's worse, worse, worse. And you know that, that moment, moment before one would pass, you would come to that, that, that site where the person is nothing but the bone and the skin on top. Um, that's almost the picture of this man. He's saying, I'm at the end. But then, is there any hope? Is there any hope? The person says, yes. I hope in your word, he says. I hope in your word, verse 90, 81. How can he hope in the word? The word hope here can be also translated as expectation. I expect. I have expectation that your word will still deliver. Your word will come. Now, we know as Christians that the word of God is not just... Uh, a projection of uh, positive thinking or feel-good message. It's not just that, oh, everything will be fine. No, no, it's not like that. The world is fallen. The life that we live is hard. Uh, scripture says if you want to live a godly life, when you are resisting the current of the, the, the culture and the time, you shall be persecuted. It's not easy. There are as Pastor Joe prayed today, people that are literally being persecuted to death because they believe in Jesus Christ. So victory does not mean that you always get delivered on this side of your life and you always come out victorious. Go home and read Hebrew 11 where it talks about many heroes of faith. But at the end of the list comes all these people who were badly, badly persecuted and damaged. People who were killed in the most grotesque form of killing as Jesus Christ himself crucified on the cross. Scripture does not call them defeated. Scripture does not call them somehow lesser than those who survived it. But the scripture calls them the people that the world was not worthy of. Heidelberg Catechism, question one. What is the only comfort only comfort that we have in this life or in death. Whether we live, whether we die, what is the only comfort that are given to us? Unfortunately, I cannot recite the answer word per word, but it basically says that we are Christ. We belong to Him. That He has given everything that He had to redeem us. That even a hair from my head will not fall without the permission of the Father. That He will keep me to the end, to eternity. That the Holy Spirit continues to work in my heart to renew that salvation assurance that I am eternally blessed by God. That the Spirit pushes me to sincerely... And in good speed, quickly, live my life for his good pleasure. My only comfort in life or in death is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So the hope that this psalmist talk about is not an artificial hope. This hope is not a temporary hope. This hope is not something that's magical, but this hope is real, eternal. It is God's way of vindicating this man. Salvation brings to us not only temporary liberation, but it gives us the ultimate vindication in the way that God has planned to work out his glory in your and my life. 
He expects it. He believes it. Then my question to us is that, where is that certainty? Where is that certainty? You know, we're living in a time when there's a lot of skepticism about the Bible. I know that, that some of you have taken Bible as literature course in college, or perhaps something about Bible, you know, wherever that you might have taken the course, um, even in a seminary setting. I think there's so many seminaries that are now um, teaching theology in a very liberal kind of uh, presupposition. Um, in the critical tradition now, they're just chopping up the word right and left, and what ends up uh, at the end is nothing but just a human witness with just human tradition. But that's where the problem is. You cannot have a Christian faith apart from the certainty that you get from the word. We believe in the inerrancy of the scripture. Inerrancy means that there is no error. And you might say, well, is that even possible in human writing? But we do claim it. I don't mean there is inerrancy in the translated Bible. Perhaps even in the manuscripts, most likely there are errors. But when we talk about inerrancy, we're talking about the original witness of God through the, the, the word of the prophets and the apostles, so-called the autographer, the original text, must be free from error. Well, then the question is, we don't even have it. Why, did, why do we even believe in it? Why do we even hold on to it? And as one person put it, one theologian said, well, it's like a bridge underwater. You may have a high water because of lots of rain. Maybe you have a kind of bridge that is meant to be that way. Water runs on top of it. But when you are crossing that, that river or that brook or whatever you're crossing, the theologian said, you're so glad that even though that bridge is invisible, you're so glad that bridge is there because you could stand on it and you could walk through it. We believe in the inerrancy. We believe in infallibility. You know what? Infallibility is different from inerrancy. Inerrancy is without error. Infallibility means absolutely reliable. Infallible. Certainty. Our faith is built up on the certainty of the word. This is not hypothetical. This is not a suggestion. The word is not always easy. I, I tell you, it's not easy. You, you do need to invest your life and training into it. But as the word says at the end of our passage today, I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad, which means you could study the word all your life. You will never exhaust it. The word of God will never become boring if you really approach it in the right way. It's always full of God's energy and his witness, breath. And the width and the depth of God's wisdom. Infallible. Absolutely certain. If not the case, our hope is in vain. Why give your life for Christ? Why become a missionary? Why become a minister of the word? Why become anything? Where you put your life on the line for the Lord. In fact, that's what we all should be. You know, you rely utterly and absolutely on the word. On his promise, you give your life to it. Why do you do it? Because there's a certainty of hope. There's certainty. This is what Paul says about resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to these words. This is Paul saying. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because he testified about God. We testified about God that he raised the Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those, who, those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people must most to be pitied. Pity, pity. It's the same reasoning of our argument, same, same reasoning. 
What Paul is saying is that if what I testify to you with my apostolic witness, that's what New Testament is, if this is not true, if there's no certainty to it, if Christ did not rise from the dead, as I testify to you, if that is not the case, then it's horrible. There's no hope. Why do anything? Why sacrifice? Why honor God with your life? Why do anything? There's no hope. But there's certainty in the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, there's no other way. There's no other way but in the Word of God. Um, let me close the message this way. Go to the communion soon. Um, isn't there quite a bit of gap between the present experience of this, this poet, that he's in such a state of desperation on one hand, and then his claim of hope and expectation on the other hand? There's a gap. Um, perhaps, I don't know, uh, where you are in your life, maybe you don't feel it as acutely as this gentleman, but you might be going through some serious crisis and even times of dryness in your life, you feel dry, you feel uh, at loss, you feel like you're at the end of the rope, you feel like there's no hope. You're, you're at that point on one hand. On the other hand, you have the word that says, no, 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 no. This is the only comfort you have, whether you live or die, in Christ. This is what it is. This is what the word says. All the suffering that you're going through, all the afflictions that you have, as in verse 71, in the earlier passage, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. There's God doing something in my life that I may not feel inspired by it. Maybe all I'm feeling is pain, but there is something that God is doing even through that. It is good for me that I was afflicted, he says. Verse 73, for your hand have made and fashioned me. It's not just creation, it's a discipline language. God, your hands are upon me. You are molding me, you're shaping me. You are making me change, and change is hard. God, you want me to change. That's the word. So you hope, you expect. As Job in his utter suffering, Job says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know I'm, I'm in this state of utter, utter destruction even. You know, people cannot even recognize me because I look so bad. But even in this time, I say I know there is a Redeemer. And when I come out of this, I will stand before Him. There is hope on one hand. But then there is this actual experience of despair. How do you get through this gap? Um... I think the human mind or human, human inside of a, of a, of a person uh, has a particular map. And uh, I'm sure if you're a psychologist or you, you're kind of expert in this, you probably have done various kind of ways to describe it. But if I remember, if I see scriptural uh, way of portraying right, what we have inside of us is what we call the heart. It's the very controlling center. That's the inner life, the heart. What gets closest to the heart is not your intellect, it's not your reasoning, but what gets closer to your heart is your affection, your emotion, your, say, um, a natural way that you feel desires. It's something closer to your heart. So it is very, very difficult for things you do here, mind, to control your heart because the emotion gets in the way. I think it's really true, you know, when, when my feeling is shaken up, when I'm not in the right mood, you know, I, I, can't, I can't think straight, <laughs> I can't say it straight, you know, I, I get really affected by the, the most emotion or the affection uh, that, that affects my heart, the way I am uh, at that moment. So it's really, 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 really difficult, but this is what the discipline is. It's the head, or it's the, the word as crystal clear as it is, right? The very reasoning or the logic of God's word, the very 
persuasion of the word of God even penetrates beyond your emotional barrier. It penetrates deeper even through into your heart. That's what we have in, in Proverbs chapter 4 where it says, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. How do we do that? And the Proverbs, the, the father tells the son, son, I, I know there's all kinds of stuff going on in your mind right now, but I tell you, listen to my word. Let my word get to your heart and it'll change you. Let my word get into your heart. Remember the time when there was that, what is a U.S. Airway? That, that plane that departed from LaGuardia that uh, got bird struck, right? And all the engines got shut down. And, and what did he do? He, he had to make a split second decision to land it on the Hudson River. Remember, you, you all remember that. It's made into a movie and everything. Imagine him. I mean, you were at that moment. Never, I, I mean, he, he was, he was well-trained, but I cannot say that he was in that same place, same situation before. An emergency like that doesn't happen twice or three times in your life. Well, too many times. It doesn't happen too many times. He was right there. Was he afraid? I'm sure he was. Was he, for that moment, fearful for his life? I'm sure. Not only himself, but for the rest. This plane could crash and everything will end. That moment... What is he doing? There's something overriding even his feeling. Something that overrides his passion. Something that overrides the way his desire somehow steers him. Uh, it's hard to imagine that we could live every day like that. But still, it's the image that I get from this poet. Poet. Beautifully emotional. Beautifully compassionate, beautiful, beautiful in aesthetics. But this man says it, or woman, I guess, <laughs> says it so clearly. She says, or he says, I know I'm feeling hopeless. I know I feel like I'm at the end of the rope. But you know what? I'm going to override that with my hope in the word. But here's the promise. The promise is that it's not going to be like a dry sand. When the word penetrates into your heart, what happens is that that word then does what? It alters your heart. Therefore, even your affection becomes holy affection. Jonathan Edwards, really big on that. Holy affection. Not just reasoning, not just logic, but something that even changes your way of feeling. It's more than feeling. Your will. Your desires, even your desires become altered by the word that affects your heart. So it says beautifully, beautifully. Verse 97, oh how I love your law. Verse 103, it's one of my favorites in 119. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. The word of God is not something that simply comes to override my immediate feeling of hopelessness or affliction. But it alters my affection to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. All through our lives, even when times are challenging and even desperate. Christians are not superhuman beings. We are human like everybody else. But we live by the certain conviction of the word of God that affects our heart and affects our affections, that affects our desires. All because the word is living and active. Because the spirit puts an engine to it. I pray, brothers and sisters, that you will walk with the word in the new year. There's no other way. 
Let's pray. Father, we come before you at this worship, affirming the word that testifies to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all other beauty of your wisdom. The word that is without error according to the self-consciousness of the scripture itself, what it claims. The word that is absolutely reliable when it comes to the testimony of how God, you, Lord, you save us through your son, Jesus Christ. This absolute certainty that we have in your word, we pray that we can claim it, we could grow in it, we will be disciplined in this, that this new year will be filled with this conviction as we walk in your way. Now as we take the communion, we pray that the word will in this way come to us in a visible, sense-filled way. We pray that you will bless us even as we take the elements. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're blessed in the New Year's um, first Sunday with um, taking the communion. Uh, it, this, this is really interesting. You know, the word uh, has come to flesh in Jesus Christ, and Jesus leaves us with a way that we experience his presence by the broken bread and uh, a wine. Uh, we call this the visible word, but, you know, it's not to worship uh, before it. Uh, you know, we 